have a, a challenging panel for you today. <laughs> I made sure all the powerful women that I know would be here. Well, that's what I said in my in my book chapter. <laughs> we need to honor the feminine. Yes. And it's a problem in the West. Right. And the East as well, yes. Pardon? It is a problem in East and West alike. Even oh, though yes. we have a goddess yeah. culture in India, I think we still have a lot of problem honoring the sacred feminine in, yes. in the spirit. We do it in ritual, yes. Yes, and I've been, I've been 44 times to India, and wow. so of course I have been exposed to many of these goddesses, but I, thanks to your article, I w I'm able to put them in a, a appropriate order for understanding them from a rational point of view, let's say. Now I can see, you know, why Indians feel a certain way about the, the different uh, goddesses. The one that I was always very favorable to was Lakshmi. I think the best restaurant in the world is actually in Chennai. It's called Anna Lakshmi. And I, I don't exactly know the, the Hindu sect that that uh, does it, but they do this restaurant as a service, as a religious service. And so the waiters and waitresses in this sect are actually very prominent people. They're lawyers and politicians and all kinds of people like that. And it mm -hmm. just so happened that uh, I showed up in Chennai one time, and it was the opening, the grand opening of Analakshmi. And uh, my Indian partner went to the door, and they said, oh, well, we're actually opening tomorrow. Uh, today's opening is only for uh, our group, but since you're here, you're our guest, so please come in. And they refused mm -hmm. to be also to be paid for that dinner. There were I think four of us, and they insisted that we come in. In the sorry, in the tradition of welcoming the guest, mm. they wouldn't let us go away, and insisted that we come in. And they were serving one another, but they also served us. And well, that's the, the tradition of the East. I remember when I was in medical school in my hometown of Ahmedabad, at Mahatma Gandhi, in his life's work, uh -huh. I would often bike to school, uh, to medical school, uh -huh. uh, in hot summer afternoons, and I would get, you know, uh, tired and hot and sweaty, and I knock at a random door mm -hmm. to get a glass of water. You know, that, that's very uh, And whenever they would see me, Often they said, oh, no, no, come in, come in the shade and sit down and have a drink and have a cup of tea, have some food. Uh, and they all knew we were like medical student types, so they had we had sort of vetted slightly, but still I was still a stranger. And that contrasts with a very interesting experience I had in Wisconsin. I was yes. presenting at a conference in Madison at the monastery there in Oregon, Wisconsin, which is the second largest monastery in the, in the U.S., I think and uh, some panel discussion on the world spirituality and I was uh, we had people from all traditions there was a Benedictine abbot uh, there was a Greek Orthodox minister there was a rabbi of course and, and I was representing Hinduism and young and uh, I was traveling from Milwaukee to Madison in a car because I was finished my day's work and it was Friday afternoon uh, it was a weekend conference Friday Saturday Sunday morning and uh, I had information this was before, you know, the GPS was very familiar and I had the answer, I'll oh, find out where it is. And the, my good friend, Catholic priest, Steve and I were driving together and we saw an address which approximated the monastery. So it was a lo long driveway. So this looks like the monastery. So I went in there uh, with my friend, I was driving and we, we knocked at the door, it was open. So I thought this should be the monastery because the door is open. So we gently knocked and went, uh, I got in and there was this big, huge guy with a big glass of, uh, uh, with a big bottle of beer in his hand and watching some game. And he was absolutely incensed that we broke into his house and he pulled out his gun 
uh, oh. and say, get out of my property in one second. I said, oh, no, I'm sorry, we're just looking for the Buddhist monastery. I said, well, we don't know what the monastery is. And uh, and uh, my friend who's Catholic priest who took out his cross, I don't know, we are good people, look, I'm a priest. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'll let you off because you're a priest with a priest. So I, we got out of there and the monastery was absolutely next door to this place. Oh my goodness. Uh, right, this was an adjacent building. So we went in this large group and I asked the uh, uh, Abba, the uh, Gesha Sopa, who's the like yeah, associate Gesha. of the holiness, and he said, well, yeah, we keep very low key because we don't want to offend the locals with the foreign culture. <laughs> so poor guy. Uh, so uh, 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 this these two contrasting experiences of what it, you know how the guest uh, guesthood is managed in different cultures. But anyway, just a story that I remember. Yeah, uh, that's. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, so I'll just mention that Kushbu, though she lives in Bangalore, also is a Gujarati from, uh, I guess, from near Ahmedabad. Yes, yes, it sounds like a Gujarati name. I'm from Ahmedabad, so I can recognize Hi, Kushbu. Yeah. And hello, all of Hi, my friends. Sir. Right. And uh, so the, the, uh, maybe I'll turn it over to Tim. And Tim, would you sort of introduce our pro, what we are doing and uh, also introduce the people that are here uh, so that Ashok is aware. Um, well, basically, the idea here is, is because of the, the virus and the fact that it's this global problem that brings us all onto the same boat. Uh, we all are suffering in this in very similar ways around the world. And uh, we're faced with a new kind of existence that we have not had to deal with before as a community, all being sequestered and being so much spent so much time with our own selves. Um, and outside of the context of business and, and regular social life. And so there's a lot of uh, anxiety and uh, loneliness and questioning that comes up that, that is supportive in whatever way we can be for, for other people who are dealing with these things. And so we are just trying to support each other and to hear each other's stories, try to commiserate to a certain degree. And for me, one of the things that's really magical about this experience is being able to talk to people all over the world, many in countries that I've not had, being able to, to just recognize that in the sisters. And so, we certainly welcome your particular perspective. Many of us here are, are inspired by union thought. Uh, some of us are professionals in one way or another. I'm an artist myself in Montana in, in the northwestern part of the US. Um, I've always been deeply inspired by Jung. Jerome Waddle is in North Carolina and he is sort of an expert in, in the personality types. Well, maybe we should each, each just maybe sent, say a sentence about ourselves mm -hmm. so that I don't have to <laughs> try to uh, misstate who you are. But Jerome, do you want to just say a sentence about yourself and pass it along? Yeah, since you started out with me, I'll do that. So, but uh, I'm retired from teaching creative leadership and uh, from a major telecommunications company and have used the Myers-Briggs types as part of a training tool. And so I became very familiar with Young, and I've spent probably about, uh, like Skip, 40 years reading uh, Young's works and uh, particularly, I l love the Red Book, so that's uh, where I'm from. Next. Cynthia. I live in Vermont in the U.S., and I'm an educator. I very little, I know very little about Jung. I, um, I know a lot of things that are Jung-adjacent, 
but I have not read any works by Carl Jung. Thank you. Nancy? I'm a retired teacher of religious studies and have a master's in Christian spirituality. Although I have talked with people from many different faiths and um, as a spiritual director, I sit and listen for the activity of God in the heart. I'm in Reno, Nevada. Yes, Sandy. Hi, I'm uh, Hi. Sandy Ansari, um, Iranian American. I live in San Diego. I have a private practice where I work with um, children that are gifted or have learning disabilities or what we call twice exceptional. Um, you know, they have a strength and a weakness combined. Uh, mm -hmm. I run social skills groups for, for uh, children and adolescents. I'm really interested in group dynamics and group relations. I'm also a lay psychoanalyst. Uh, and, uh, you know, it informs my practice. And I'm very, very fascinated by the relationship that Jung and Freud had with each other. And uh, my original, my master's thesis was on personality type. And that was way before I got into psychoanalytic stuff. So I'm kind of coming back around now that I'm getting a little older. <laughs> and I, let me just mention that Tim, who is my cohort on this and is on the Eros end of the spectrum. And I came from the Logos end, but I came far over to Eros. Uh, Tim is an artist. When he said that, it was a bit attenuated, but he's a professional artist of international renown and has done sculptures for Desmond Tutu and uh, the UN and was the first artist to uh, have a solo exhibition at the Hermitage in St. Petersburg. So Miles, next. Uh, hello everyone, uh, my name is Miles Slegg. I'm on the traditional territory of the Niatsitapi people, also known as the Blackfoot Confederacy in Alberta, Canada. I uh, formerly was a professional civil engineer, worked with railways for 30 years, and I was laid off, and since being laid off, I've been trying to discover what is the most meaningful and purposeful thing I can do in what I call the home stretch. I met Skip, and I've learned about Jung, and that has greatly shifted my um, my focus on where I'm heading uh, in the so-called home stretch. Thank you. Kushbu? Go ahead. Namaste, sir. Um, okay, I think I'll, I'll just address you. So I, I am Guju, happy, very proud Guju. Um, also Mumbai girls spent uh, sufficient time over there. My teenage was there, so. Um, and at present, I am, I am solely focused on healing and um, being authentic to myself. And that is, that is where my love for Jungian literature comes. And I, more than the literature, I am very fascinated, very, very fascinated by the man and uh, his processes. So, yeah, same with Gandhi Bapu. So I have. Most of my time, my day, I have been in between, like observing, studying this, this uh, patterns of these two men. I've been obsessed by it happily. <laughs> Kushbu has expressed uh, an aspiration to translate Jungian works into Hindi. Uh, so, yes. And Gujarati, yes, of course. And Gujarati will be very easy for me, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and I, 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 yeah, that is what I want to do. Like, if if like I don't know, I will figure it out. But that is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Yeah. Translate you Yankee might, word. That's it. <laughs> you might want to contact Dr. Minakshi Parekh at the BJ Medical College in Ahmedabad. She is the direct, co-director of the Ahmedabad Young Center, which I established under the auspices of the IAAP, which is the International Young Body. I'm the liaison person for India, young groups in India. We have established 
three of them, Ahmedabad, Bangalore, and Mumbai. And the Bangalore is now independent. It's now over 15 years, so, I, so they, are, uh, they are now launched. Uh, Ahmedabad is very active, uh, and uh, we have 67 members, and eight or 10 of them are in already training already uh, with Zurich, I mean, in the process of getting trained. And uh, uh, they are very much into young, of course. They are all aspiring to be young analysts, uh, eight or 10 of these young people. So uh, you might contact them and collaborate with them. That'll be helpful yeah, to both sides. Sure, so, Dr. Minakshi Parekh from where, sir? Yeah. Uh, BJ Medical College, Ahmedabad. Got it, got it. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Cindy, go ahead. Oh, um, good afternoon, uh, Ashok and everybody. Um, I am, um, by trade, I am a, a addiction counselor, therapist, and a psychiatric nurse. And I am a practicing Buddhist for many years, uh, but I have experience with many religions, and this is how I've gotten to know Skip. And uh, so I'm learning more about Jung and... Uh, I just appreciate you coming today. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, Mirtas. Hello, I'm Mirtas. I'm from Brazil. Hi. And I, hi. I, I'm an educator. And I'm here. I, I got to this group and started to, to, learn and study about the Jungian psychology because of BTS. Mm -hmm. That's how I met Ski. <laughs> BT, BTS, the, BTS yes, the Korean uh, K-pop group. Yes, I mean, my, my good friend Murray Stein in Zurich has been very uh, inspirational to that group. Uh, yes. Murray uh, yeah. is a good colleague from Chicago where I uh, work, work now. And, uh, I mean, not work there, I'm a faculty, but I and affiliated with the Chicago Young Institute, and he was the past president of Chicago Institute, moved to Zurich, and that he was inspiration for this group to pick up the map of the soul. Uh, yes. So, uh, Joss, are you awake? Uh, I don't. Uh, the the big green yes. J. Oh, you are there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can you introduce <laughs> yourself? <laughs> okay. Aloha, everybody. Just uh, woke up a few minutes. And um, I'm Joss Ashok, and um, I'm, kind of, I'm, I'm thrilled to, to um, listen to what the um, wonderful pearls of wisdom you have to offer to, to us in, in this group. I'm a retired psychiatrist, uh, transformed into ballroom dancer, and uh, live in Hawaii. I was brought up Catholic, but now I'm much more expansive, and I'm in the religion of the heart. Um, I mm. love Anthony DeMello and uh, Joseph Campbell. Uh, had a spattering of training a little bit in introduction training of Jungian and Freud, but not much as you know, like in psychiatry, they don't teach very much of that stuff. But I know Skip for more than 20 years now, and that's how I got into the group. So I'm happy to be here to, uh, this morning. Yeah, thank you, Josh. Thank you. Yeah, of course, part of the inspiration for doing this series of conversations is to recognize my friend and maybe your friend, uh, Thomas Arst, who I suspect is one of the first uh, victims of the coronavirus. He, mm -hmm. di he officially died of a heart attack, but and that happened on Easter Sunday, but the Germans have been lying about their numbers, and um, you know they claim they have less than half a percent deaths as compared to the west the rest of Western Europe, which is saying ten percent deaths. So I suspect that Thomas was an early victim, and that's one of the reasons why the Aronos conference that I would have been at right today, and you might have been at was canceled so early. I suspect that Thomas probably was sick when he arranged to cancel the conference. So uh, mm -hmm. if you have any thoughts about Thomas, we'd love to hear those and anything else you have to say. So the, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you all for inviting me and sharing uh, our collective 
wisdom in this very difficult time for us uh, as a global community. I did have dealings with Thomas. Uh, first of all, condolences to you uh, on your personal loss. While it's a loss for all of us collectively, I know for you it is a specifically a personal loss. Thomas and I never met face to face, but we met uh, through uh, our collaboration on putting uh, the my chapter of the Red Book uh, Reflections. And I was deeply moved by his devotion, by his selflessness, and, uh, and his devotion to disseminating the ideas which can be of help to the collective. Uh, many people who don't read, but they leave footprints in the sands of the collective. Uh, and uh, you know, he said that we all die twice. Uh, we die when our body dies, is the first step. But we really only die when the last person who has a memory of us dies. And in that context, Tom will live for a long, long time because the memory and the footprints of what he left behind for us will endure for a long time. So uh, he will not be forgotten. And, um, and I think we should all have a sense of gratitude for his devotion and his service to be collected. A few people in the world who have such a calling, and Tom was one of them. So that uh, is my fond memory of him. Uh, in terms of uh, our dialogue for today, I can say a lot and not a lot, but let me just share some opening reflections and perhaps that will guide us together. I do a blog every morning with a, every day with a colleague, uh, Robert Jakala, Dr. Jakala from Los Angeles. He's a, a Jungian psychotherapist as well as a photographer. And uh, we've collaborated for the last many, many years, we're good friends and colleagues. And he sends me, since the start of the coronavirus pandemic, he sends me an image every day with some reflections, an image that calls him in response to this collective crisis. And I amplify that image from a Jungian and personal perspective. And we kind of, uh, it is an alchemic mix of our thoughts, shared thoughts, perceptions, feelings, and responses. And I put it on my blog. Uh, and uh, so you're all welcome to eyeball it. But I wanted to share that information because this morning I had a dream. And it has been my experience that when a dream comes in, in as a preface to some event that I'm participating in, I always wonder if it is dream just for me or also for the collective. And after I reviewed the dream, I was very clear that it was also for the collective. It was for me as well as the collective. So I put it in my blog and I'm also sharing it with this group as an opening statement about the instructions from the depth. So here is a dream. And I offer it as as if it was your dream, once I put it out in the collective, it's a gift to the collective. So each one of you must treat it as if it is your dream, not my dream. But my personal context is irrelevant for our collective, but the collective context is relevant. So in this dream, I'm in my home in Milwaukee, and we have a guest. And the guest is His Holiness, <clears throat> the Dalai Lama. I had the privilege to meet him twice in Madison, but this, in this dream it was a visit to our home. And I'm with, with him in my study, and I'm doing some chore for him on the internet. He says, you know, make, uh, do this, some emails for me. And so I was, uh, was uh, being his, uh, kind of doing his chores, helping him with his online communication. And after that, he said, well, thank you. And he said, I would like to look around your house. And I said, of course, I'm honored. And after that, he saw a room, which was our guest room. And he said, well, this sounds inviting. May I lie down for uh, for some time to rest? I said, I'm kidding. Of course, you can lie down. You can stay with us. Our home is your home. Uh, so uh, he lie down in the, in the guest room. And I closed the door. And then I went to my study. And I was looking for a sticky note to put it on the 
on the door so that no one disturbs him because children sometimes, grandchildren, family get around. But unfortunately, I could not find a sticky note which was clean. All of them had scribbles on it, which kind of is probably how it is in my process. Uh, so I assume well, that I just have to take a chance that no one disturbs him. I'll guard the door as best as I know. Suddenly, I downstairs, I hear a commotion, which was the last thing I wanted. But I had a guest who wanted to rest. And uh, so I rushed down there to sort of search them, quiet them. It was my daughter, Ami, and my grandson, one of my two grandsons, uh, Loki, uh, were visiting and they were making, they were being boisterous because they were glad to see us. So uh, on one hand, I'm very, was very excited about seeing them. On the other hand, I was saying, shush, we have a guest, very important guest who's uh, taking a nap. And then they kind of got the message that they, they quieted down a little bit. Uh, and the dream ended and I woke up. So here is a, is a dream. And I think for me personally, I can just share two or three reflections that in this time of crisis, because such a big dream is always uh, uh, instruction, a set of prescriptions for us, for me personally and for us collectively. So the first prescription, of course, was very clear that uh, you know our society has to go online and everyone must get with the program and get very good, like we all have done here uh, with, uh, with this uh, uh, Tim and uh, Skip. You all have put this wonderful forum together with the wizardry of online communication. So and those of us who are not very good at it need to get help from those of you like who can help. And, those who are good must reach out and help others who, so we can study clearly use advice in global communication, meaning people should stay connected. That was our message. Thirdly, that there's a, a sacred guest from the, uh, the divine guest from, from the depths, from the soul, from the collective in India, we call it the visit of the Rishi, the visit of the, what Jung would call in his red book, the Philemon, the anchorite. Uh, Philemon and Bacchus had this divine guests uh, Zeus and, and Jupiter, Zeus and, and Hermes. So all of us will receive a, a, a depth a guest from the word depths, a Rishi, an anchorite, a soul guide, a mentor that will guide us and we must pay attention to that uh, divine visitor and take the prescriptions very seriously. Number three was that the spiritual dimension needs to make a a place in your home must rest in your home, must rest in your heart, must rest in your consciousness. So it is not going to go away, it will stay there till we need active guidance. But at the same time, as we honor this sacred dimension, my daughter, who's like my emergent anima, and my grandson, who's the emergent self, so new ideas, new energies, new perspectives, new initiatives, uh, new uh, sort of uh, opus that will be activated in response to this crisis must be balanced with the spiritual dimension. So we must be in the now, but we must also be in the timeless dimension, the transcendent dimension. So the mundane and the sacred, the now and the timeless, the temporal and transcendent must do their dance together for us to respond optimally to this crisis. And, and, and based on my brief chapter in the Red Book, uh, series, I would say it is a time to, even though we have the spiritual response, but the the feminine dimension, my daughter Ami, who's an advocate of the underdog, she's a very young, activist uh, young lady, um, that energy, that fearless girl energy in the Wall Street Journal, uh, you know, and, and the, uh, there was, a, I say this in my chapter, the, the bull of the, the Wall Street is in juxtaposition to the fearless gull statue. So that fearless anima dimension must step up to the plate for us to mount a vibrant, uh, collective, collaborative anima response to this crisis from a feeling function, not just the spirits or the logos. So the logos and the arrows, the thinking and the feeling, the timeless and the uh, and the temporal must come together. And lastly, the messages we get from this must uh, be endured and must be passed on. Once the crisis is over, because the crisis is here for a reason, the way we have insulted the environment and we have become uh, sort of nationalized and we've become provincial and we've become isolated. 
even though we are in an era of globalization, everyone for themselves culture, every country for themselves. That is a uh, isolated provincial response. We will need a collective global uh, response to this, and that. Uh, and we will be, be one which will respect the environment and respect the family. And all those energies must endure beyond this crisis, otherwise we'll only be revisited by this kind of crisis time and again. So those are some of my initial reflections uh, to kind of uh, kick off our discussion. Thank you. Well, that's very powerful. Um, I, I wonder if uh, on this last point, um, about how we've become professional or provincial, I'm sorry, in, in the context of um, uh, analysis, I know that it's very common for the first thing you run into in analysis is uh, evil. And uh, I wonder if in, in terms of the collective, uh, what we're seeing now is, is this kind of provincial evil and, uh, and that maybe we have to work back toward, you know, the emergence of the feminine and recognizing that we're all in the same lifeboat together, regardless of our uh, nationality or race or what have you. And uh, we need to uh, pull ourselves back together. And of course, it's true that, um, after every war, it's the women who pull the society back together, usually. Um, and uh, that's clearly evidenced after, you know, in Germany, post-World War I and post-World War II. Um, and uh, it's very evident for, to me for uh, post-World War II in Japan as well, where I have spent eight years. So do you have any comment on what I just said? Well, clearly, I think we each each sort of community will have to have a sort of a global, uh, a sort of a local initiative to manage the local situation. But without a global context, we are on a Titanic, which will sink. And it does not matter which, uh, you know, in which room you are in the Titanic, unless we all collectively have a plan to get on our lifeboats and help each other to be safe at sea, just as we are safe at home. Uh, we will all sink together. Cannot no nation, no family, no community can survive in isolation of the rest of the context. Uh, I wonder if, um, in the context of your um, essay, if if you would, uh, for those people that are, watch this on playback. Um, mm -hmm. You know, everyone here has had an opportunity to look at your essay um, mm -hmm. because I saw to that, uh, although what they got was my marked up version of it. <laughs> but I wonder okay. if you just especially cover the emergence of the feminine and these, the feminine in the context of the chakras and that sort of thing, because many Americans who are into spirituality at all are interested in, in uh, the chakras and Kundalini in gyms all over the country. I, as I once quipped, uh, there are Hindu meditation teachers in Nebraska, <laughs> but they're in gyms. <laughs> so I wonder if you just uh, sort of summarize that process yes. and, and how they compare across societies. Certainly, yes, I can give a, a brief synopsis of you know, what I said in that particular piece. Well, you know, as you know, when Jung was lost after his breakup with Freud, uh, he was at sea, he was uh, in despair, he was depressed, he was suicidal at times. It was his dark night of the soul. Uh, he had lost his coordinates, he had lost his guru, his mentor, his friend, his guide. Uh, and, uh, and after that, soon after that, 1913, the World War I broke out. So he was isolated, he was broke up from his mentor, Freud. He was disconnected from the rest of the analytic community because of the war. He was in uh, Switzerland and the rest of the analysts were in war-torn Europe. Uh, and uh, and he was all by himself, and he had no theory to guide his work. 
and he had some major disagreements with Freudian approach. So he was an orphan. And uh, in that era, in that particular sector of his life, he had a choice to make to, uh, to sort of basically uh, be lost, stay lost, stay depressed, or find a way. So then he did the best he knew how, which was to go, instead of going out, to go within, to go inside himself and had an encounter with his own unconscious. So he started to journal every day, he started to draw mandalas, he started to read a lot, he started to dialogue with himself. And that uh, particular dialogue uh, was of course his, uh, his journey, his inner journey, his encounter with the, with the dark side of the soul. And he, of course, we are fortunate to have a glimpse into that because his work was published Hundred years later, in two thousand nine, in the Liber Novus, the Red Book, we have personal member of his encounter with the unconscious. Uh, so it's a must read for those who want to get a prototype of how to make this journey, uh, this descent into the unconscious, like in Dante's Inferno, to go down. Except that Dante had a friend Virgil to go down, and uh, Young was on his own. So that was quite a journey. But here is a summary of his journey, which. Uh, is a sort of very good summary of a very profound work, but just for sake of brevity. He meets several parts of himself as he goes into his own depths. He meets uh, uh, different animus figures. He meets, meets Escobar, the giant of the East, and how he deals with the Eastern issue in his work. He, uh, he meets uh, other self figures, but at the end, uh, he he transits through his encounter with the feminine in his encounter with Salome uh, of, the, of the Christian tradition. Uh, and only, in, in, as you know, Salome is a very ambivalent figure in Christian tradition. I'll come to that in a minute. But at the end of his journey, he encounters Philemon. Philemon is the archetype of the wise old man. The archetype of the guru, the archetype of the guide, the archetype of the mentor, the archetype of Krishna and Arjuna. So it was his Krishna, uh, but he's a sort of a much wiser figure. Uh, so he moves from his identification as, uh, with the hero, Siegfried, uh, the, the, the knight in the shining armor of the Freudian empire, the Freudian uh, establishment. Uh, he had to kill that part of himself off. The murder of the hero, the sacred identification with the prince hero archetype, and to be a homeless, to be a, a, a orphan, and then he finds an inner parent, an inner soul guide, a deeper and higher part of self, the Rishi, the anchorite, the Philemon, whose story is very instructive. But I will uh, not get too caught in it; otherwise, I will be talking for hours. Uh, and and then of course he feels at home with Philemon. And that is what he became uh, at the end. And of course, the Philemon uh, uh, instructions come from his fascination with Goethe's Faust. So it's a very long story. It really it's a discussion for, for days together. Uh, but in Faust, at the end, Faust, uh, who had read A Day with the Devil, is doing one good deed at the end of his life, which is to reclaim land from the sea and make it into a, a living colony for the poor and the regular people to live. So he's trying to do a good deed at the end. But unfortunately, the devil got into the mix because one of the people who are living in his reconstruction uh, was Philemon and Bacchus, the, the old couple. And he tells the devil to uh, this, this Staphylis, to pay whatever it takes, but to reclaim that land so there's a nice, even new development. And of course, devil uh, misconstrues not by by default, but by design. Uh, and after offering a large sum of money to this couple, uh, and they refuse to leave, he just kills them, murders them. And he says, well, I did what it took to get rid of them. So he had followed Faust's instruction, but not in spirit, only in letter. And of course, uh, the, the whole idea that Jung had is that the problem of Western civilization is the murder of this wise old man, this Philemon, this anchorite. Uh, for material ascendancy. So we have killed the spiritual to claim material ascendancy. So in his tower in, uh, uh, in um, Zurich, 
yeah, he has this, in Bollinger Tower, he has this inscription, the murder of Philemon and the repentance of Faust. And that is the central problem of the global, say, of, of the global order right now, that in our quest for material ascendancy, we have killed out, killed up, decimated the spiritual dimension of our consciousness. So that is the main theme of, of his opus. However, where I come in, in my protest to the problem uh, that is at hand, is that the only feminine encounter with the anima figure he has primarily is with Salome. And Salome is a very ambivalent figure in Western civilization, because on one hand, she got the head of John the Baptist on a platter uh, for, the, uh, for the king. Uh, but she's also reputed to be the one who was one of the women who was closest to Christ uh, and his story. And he was, she was the one who found, uh, who gave him, offered him a, a drink of water as he was bearing his cross on the, uh, towards his crucifixion. And also one of the women who I think found uh, and declared his uh, sort of resurrection to, to the world. So in some ways, She's seen as sort of a betrayer of the tradition. On the other hand, she's seen as a, a sort of a anima figure to the, to the redeemer. So in the West, we have this ambivalence about the feminine. Uh, and, uh, and so also in the East, uh, and so there's the whole story that I go into that also a little bit, that is the whole idea of Kundalini system coming in. Uh, but here, for our purposes, is that even though we are on this quest of spiritual restoration, we are missing an important step in the process. And that step is to honor the anima, the feminine dimension. We stay ambivalent about it. We sort of give lip service to it. It sounds good, but we are not really walking the walk. And the question is, in this crisis, as in all other major confrontations, we as a global civilization have with our own redemption, with working through to higher consciousness, to that uber mensch dimension of our emergence. What are we going to do with the feminine dimension? How are we going to honor it? Are we going to stay ambivalent about it? Uh, that remains the central question even in crisis. What does a masculine response look like versus an anima informed, thoughtful, soulful, feeling function mediated, feminine response to the same crisis? So that in my dream was also the case. On one hand was attending to his holiness Dalai Lama. On the other hand, is to order the emerging, emerging anima, my daughter. How are the two to be brought into alignment? That remains our problem. See, I'm wondering if you could address um, the difference between uh, maybe the Hindu perspective and the Christian perspective, or maybe the difference in the in an eastern view of civilization because in the west you know we always have trouble incorporating the feminine it is such mm -hmm. a it's such a patriarchal system and we don't have very many avenues into the feminine i wonder if you uh could maybe illuminate the the hindu perspective or to give us an idea of how that is addressed from your perspective? Certainly, yes. Well, I, I think it's a tall order, but I'll do my best to give my humble perspective. Uh, here is an Eastern approach to crises and traumas, uh, which is well summarized in Bhagavad Gita, chapter uh, 5, paragraph 7 and 8, is the central instruction of Bhagavad Gita. And in this, as you know, whenever uh, there is trouble in the collective, Lord Vishnu, the protector of the universe, reincarnates his avatar as a Vishnu to restore the dharmic order. Uh, the, the seventh and eighth paragraph of chapter five of Bhagavad Gita says, whenever sacred duty decays, then wherever there is a dysfunction, imbalance, crisis, trauma in the collective, and men of virtue are compromised by men who do evil, meaning when the dark forces overcome the forces of light and consciousness. Then I, meaning Vishnu, 
incarnate myself, Arjuna, he says to his protege, to restore the dharmic order in age after age. So, which is the central formula of the Jungian paradigm, that whenever our ego consciousness or collective is out of balance, is out of sync with its own depths, with its own soul's program, then the archetypes, the, the depth of our own depths, personal and collective, sort of incarnates, compensates for it by sending out a messenger to the consciousness to restore the order of our individuation process, the order of our redemption, the order of our rescue from, from our own darkness. So Vishnu, of course, has incarnated nine times so far, there are nine incarnations of Vishnu, subject which is beyond the scope of our, our brief discussion today. Uh, so it is so it is said that the tenth incarnation of Vishnu will happen when we are in big trouble. It looks like we are in fairly big trouble now. And it is said that the tenth incarnation will be a man called Kalki, which is a distortion uh, in interpretation by uh, by scholars. Because Kalki, they say, will be a magnificent warrior man who will come from the east and so forth. I think that's a total sort of matri uh, patriarchal distortion because Kalki, I think the tenth incarnation of these two will be a woman. It will not be a man. Of course, gods are endogenous, so it's our perception, but it will come in its primarily feminine context. It will be a woman leader, it will be feminine consciousness. Kalki is closer to Kali rather than uh, in many Indian traditions, Kalki, Kali is also called Kalki, Kalki Mata, the great Kali goddess. So it will be the dark goddess uh, who is fierce, who amputates, who blood sucks the dark side and restores the meek and the weak to their rightful place. Uh, in the order of the universe. Uh, but it says in the, in the Christian tradition that the meek shall rule the world. So meek is not the same as weak. Uh, and outwardly strong is not the same as relevant. So I think in my proposal, I said that on the, on the Christian tradition, in the Western and Lytic tradition, we have this ambivalence about Salome. We uh, like her, but we are also skeptical of her as a betrayer. Uh, in the Eastern tradition, we know that a new uh, incarnation of the collective unconscious, a new archetypal activation is in play, but we are assuming it will be masculine. It's, it will be warrior-like. That, I think, is the last thing we need. We need Kalki, the great dark goddess, who will be the one who sacrifices the darkness of the collective and restore the light, the spirituality, and uh, as the ascendant consciousness, as a pacemaker of, of the global consciousness. That is my thought. Thank I think you. That, I think that that's uh, very interesting. I want to share with you uh, something uh, from Buddhism, and maybe you're aware of this, but um, let's see if I can share this. Uh, this is uh, uh, Funakanan. And uh, this is uh, the so-called goddess of mercy, but um, mm -hmm. she was very important to me in my high school years because I would see her every day. And um, I didn't know why she was soothing to me, but I, I found seeing her to be a very so soothing thing. And... Mm -hmm. um, it's only in the last, let's say, five years that I actually learned what she meant. Uh, and she was built just, um, uh, she was built uh, about, finished about three months before I arrived in Japan in 1962. Mm -hmm. And um, her, as, as Kenan, um, she is the goddess that, um, performed the harrowing of hell in effect, what Jesus did in the harrowing of hell. In other words, her task was to go to the underworld and redeem the souls of all the Japanese war dead. So I think of all those uh, powerless men who 
uh, gave their lives to a, to a lost cause that, of course, mm -hmm. Americans are always very masculine about. But, you know, having lived in Japan again, then 20 years later, I went to, I knew that Yasukuni Shrine was a, a shrine to the Japanese war dead, and it's just across from uh, the Imperial Palace in Tokyo. And uh, the symbolism of that shrine is quite um, powerful because it's filled with cherry trees. And so every spring, all these cherry trees, of course, blossom. And then five days later, all the blossoms fall to the earth. And uh, so as a, as a symbol of, of the Japanese losses in World War II, it's quite, quite powerful. And um, so I just mentioned those things, but I want, I'm going to mute myself so others can have a chance here. Well, I, uh, I would like to, you, know, you talked about when Young encountered, was reading about uh, Faust uh, and that, uh, you know, Philemon was murdered by the evil. Uh, and this really shook Young up. And so his whole vision was to prevent that from happening. And I think that uh, because he saw Philemon as his source uh, back to the, to the supreme knowledge, he called it. That's where he got his uh, messages from. And that's what he was writing about. And uh, I think that when he, the anima and the animus relationship that he uh, found was, uh, and he was really, for the Catholic Church, uh, for the Virgin Mary, uh, bringing her into the, that particular church. So I think he's aware of it, but it's, and, and you see that's happening today because of, as you say, the compensatory uh, that's happening because of our culture has gone too far uh, in that direction. Mm -hmm. And I guess I was wondering what can we do as to help facilitate that uh, um, process speed it up maybe maybe not <laughs> <laughs> good question I would say, uh, that's a very good question and i would say that there are two levels at which we have to attend to it and he was always uh, very clear about his instruction or guidance on that issue for to himself one is that each one of us must do our inner work and in our, in our own inner work, if we establish a balance between the spiritual and the material, between the ego-driven masculinity and the sacred femininity, to honor the anima function within each one of us, then each one of us becomes the scintilla uh, of the collective. Because in the Vedas it says, uh, as self, so the universe, uh, as swayam, so brahmanam, meaning as we become whole, we make the universe whole. And as we become balanced, we balance the universe. So each one of us is a pacemaker of the balance. So I would say each one of us may feel powerless, but we have the maximal power to impact the collective by doing our own inner work. So that is very, very precious uh, in terms of Jung's contribution. Uh, and of course, it's consistent with the ancient wisdom of the Hindus about the Vedanta, which say, as swayam, so Brahman, Brahmanam, as self, so the collective. So even each one of us is balanced, we are making a contribution to the welfare of the collective. And that is a yoga tradition. I don't want to get too distracted quoting that and getting into it, but that clearly is the summary. At the second level, of course, uh, is the whole idea of our leadership. Those who have any authority, whether as a principal in a school or a head of a family, or of course, a mayor or a president or whatever, each of these successive layers of collective leadership establishes a similar balance, and we hope and we pray they do, then of course the process is exponential. But 
never forget the power of the individual uh, to impact this collective change. That's great. Um, and that's part of one of my mentors uh, who taught me was uh, he was involved in teaching creative leadership. And he said, we need to train the leaders in, in this, uh, uh, you know, uh, about developing themselves uh, mm -hmm. first, and then you can lead. Uh, I have a question, Andy. Um, it, I, I, I suppose I'm also trying to kind of ground, ground the, the group right now. I, I'm, I'm interested in... Uh, Jung, the, the man, Jung, the person, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a, a living, ordinary person with the depth, you know, and uh, I've been listening to various people interviewing, um, you know, his grandchildren, they've been uploading several videos recently of many, many interviews, um, which has been lots of fun to, to get like a you know, inside scoop of, of Jung's life. Almost every person who is interviewing somebody that Jung knew, they ask about their, his relationship with Tony Wolf. Some would say she was like his anima, you know, or, you know, I mean, we're talking about this feminine, feminine energy, this feminine wisdom. And at the time that Jung was having a crisis, he, you know, he had a kind of experience, encounter with her and she later, you know, led the way in a lot of his his work so are you familiar with their dynamic and also um what are your thoughts about jung the man and his experiences with accessing um being anima informed you know as you say well i would admit i have a very limited interest in jung as a personal uh, and his personal life I think basically in my way of looking at it, it is essentially irrelevant to our understanding the analytical thought. I think he was merely the shaman, the channel that passed on, became the conduit as every era, every time has its own conduits to pass on the collective wisdom to the collective consciousness. It was just a conduit who uh, was at the right place at the right time, with the right background, a rich wife, uh, a stimulating uh, cultural and academic uh, environment in, in his place and time. Uh, he was a very imperfect man. Uh, but here is what we just say the ad hominis anomaly that the, the ideas that a person has stand, must stand on their own feet irrespective of their personal story. So if they stand up to evidence, if they stand up to experience, if they stand up even to empirical investigation, then they could be, should be taken seriously, uh, irrespective of who put it together. So personally, I should admit, because when I read Young, I basically see a slightly simplified version of Vedic literature, uh, which is timeless, with some very good new amplifications and making it more clinically relevant. Uh, and more uh, humanistically relevant to, to our time and our situation and problems. Uh, and to, for that, I think we are we're all very grateful for his opus and his work, his tireless work in dealing with these issues. Uh, so I think uh, his relationship with Tony Wolf, uh, he had an affair, he was a married man, but I would say we can judge it or we can understand it as the archetype of Krishna and gopis. If you see that in a analytical sense, then uh, you would say why well, Krishna has 16,000 lovers. Of course, that's not possible. So it's not to be seen in a literal, but in a metaphorical, in a symbolic sense. So I would be more interested in the symbolic dimension of his relationship with uh, Tony Wolf. I think uh, his wife, uh, Emma, was a wonderful support to him. He was rich, she was intelligent, she did wonderful research on the, uh, the, uh, the, the myth of the Holy Grail, uh, and uh, along with Juan Franz. Uh, so that was his, his, what I would call institutional anima. 
And I would say Tony Wolf was a little more of his intellectual anima. So he had that uh, energy that was projected onto her. Uh, if it was a sexualized relationship, that was a, another layer to it, but I don't think it was as much about arrows as about a projection of anima. All of us, that is the psychodynamics of affairs that men and women can't quite get hold of, get their hands around their animus, their contrasexual archetype. Uh, then they literalize it, they act out of it, they project it onto someone and they confuse the person with their own inner projection because the world is a Roshas test. The outer world is merely a screen for projection of our soul's program. And those of us who don't see that, that the, sub, the objective world is merely a mirror of our own subjectivity. And those of us who can grasp that profound truth uh, that was in Vedanta as self, so the universe. So each, and Einstein said that too, there is no real reality. The reality is merely a function of the, of the context of the observer. So I would say when we see an animal figure as a seductress and get caught in that dimension, erotic dimension rather than the spiritual dimension of it, then of course we won't do justice to the archetype of Krishna and Gopi. But when we see that as a projection of the unlived potentials of the self, which need to be reclaimed, and the other is merely carrying that sacred dimension of our projection, which we must understand and honor uh, as a projection. So then those are some of my reflections about that. But, uh, question. <laughs> Jay, I a, I, could I just inter interject before you, you speak, Nancy? I just want to make one comment. Uh, mm -hmm. I thought that um, Andrew Lloyd, Lloyd Webber um, sort of summed up this quandary uh, when he, uh, in Jesus Christ Superstar, in the song that Mary Magdalene r sings, she says, I don't know how to love him. He's a man, he's just a man, and I've had so many men before in very many ways, he's just one more. It strikes me that the, that the question uh, comes, Sandy's question partially comes from a prejudice that comes from uh, a puritanical base in the United States, sort of a puritanical stream and doesn't recognize the points that you're uh, making. But anyway, Nancy, I, go I think go you're ahead. making an assumption about prejudice. My question was just merely about him as a human being, and I'm not making any prejudice about what he does or doesn't do. Okay. I think it's all nice. Prejudice is a, is a poor word. I, I apologize for that. Um, I don't mean that. This question is prejudicial. I think it's a very good inquiry. And we all struggle with that. But I think in that inquiry is the seed of that clarification that all of us are human and we often get caught in animus or anima projection. And that's fine. That's good. That's a human, you know, dividend of humanity, us being human. And if that person is available and we are eligible for that encounter, then, you know, that God's be with you. But I, what I'm urging to do is to always look and the spiritual and the projection dimension, even when you are married to, like my wife, I, I see her as a tremendous anima figure. Uh, she carried all the stuff that I can't carry. I would not be able to carry this lifetime. I'm grateful that she is my wife and she's also able to carry much of it. I, I try to uh, take back some of those projections that I have so that she's not burdened by them as much as she has been over the years. Uh, but I think uh, your point, Sandy, is quite right that we must see the projective dimension of our human encounters as we also deal with them as real. I mean, there is a real person yes. out there. Yes. Uh, so those are the, that's the duality. Yes, uh, like like in your in your dream, because I'm more more of a neo Freudian analyst, I, my brain did automatically think of interpreting it in a in a in that fashion. Um, mm -hmm. But I really love the way you put it out there. And my first thought was, well, every character in, in the dream is oneself. So there's a Dalai Lama inside you that really is just an ordinary man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. But a spiritual reflection is what counts, not a regular humanity. I believe a regular person is 
you know, like the rest of us. You're quite right about that. Yeah, so Nancy, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Please continue. Uh, last summer, I had an experience I call the rising of the divine feminine. And I've read recently that women need to have an encounter with the feminine side of the self. Uh, are you using the term honor the anima function in, the, in that way? How are you using the anima function as it relates to women? Well, I think the women, uh, uh, I think, should, uh, two ways. First of all, for men, clearly, the anima function is the contrasexual archetype. But I would say the, uh, for women, it will be honoring not only their physical femininity, but their spiritual femininity. I think that is something that women often don't have the opportunity to embrace as clearly as uh, would be conducive to a deeper level of individuation. Uh, because they, uh, women bring much more to the table than society will admit to. But unfortunately, sometimes even they themselves don't admit their own authority, agency, uh, and wisdom, uh, and their soulfulness into the equation. So to starting to honor that part of ourselves would be a very important task for those who see this in that frame, in terms of analytical frame. Similarly for men, I think each man, each man, each individual, must deal with their own animus, which is not just their masculinity, the misogynistic, toxic masculinity, uh, but their own uh, sort of human agency of, of what we traditionally call male spirituality will be uh, honor, uh, capacity for sacrifice, capacity for, uh, for uh, the logos, not that it is a sole domain of men, but let's say traditionally that's how we see it, uh, their own spiritual ascendancy, their capacity to protect the clan among all those dimensions of sacred masculinity uh, in its all its variations and colors and hues and uh, must be honored by each man. And then we have a more complete picture what Nietzsche calls the overbench, the higher self can emerge to this transition in deeper work. For Jung himself, he was caught with the sacred, the hero, the heroic masculinity. He had to kill it, sacrifice it, so he could embrace the, the Rishi, the anchorite, the guide, the, uh, the Philemon part of himself. So I would say Animus would be to move from the hero to the wise old man, to the, uh, the spiritual dimension of uh, our masculine wisdom. So that would be what Animus would look like for men. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Kushbu. Um, I, I wanted to come, come back to your dream and uh, uh, say, say this. So, so when you, a little bit of political reference, you guys, you guys might not understand, like, uh, but you will catch up eventually. I'll phrase it such a way. So just, just yeah. So so when NRC, I, I am a social worker, and I'm a, I, I I like researching and doing things which I love, and I love my work. So so I'm a social worker, and when NRC uh, happened, um, uh, I started studying about how we are treating refugees in our country who are already there. Like we want to bring more, sure, let's bring it. Just, I, but I wanted to look at how, how, how we are treating the, the, the ones who are already there. And La, Dalai Lama is one of them. Dalai Lama is a refugee, homeless mm -hmm. man of, 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 of India. And, and, um, again, as a social worker, like, or as a common, common person, common sensible person of India will know that the, the way COVID is going to grow, it is going to grow in the, the 
homeless communities and the the people who were not not able to be quarantined uh, so like oh my god there are so many people gathering it's like a wedding the like you know ev- everywhere it's like small small wedding people are distributing food and like that amount of crowd it's there i was able to i am seeing it every day kind of so so it is connecting me the light in your of your dream the lai lama is presenting this homeless refugee which we really have to take care because he he is supposed to be treasured like even if like you go to he is the last lama in, in that way also spiritually also it is very important like politically also global peace level also so it, so it is like that necessary as yeah and children as for your dream children might make noise they have arrived oh god corona is arrived kind of so i it, it is a, uh, i'm just building on it and it is just making sense like it is there's a synchronicity to my active imagination it may be so that was that was one thing about your dream and when you were talking Now, about geeta in the in the way the young kids work with dream is once it is gifted it becomes your dream so now you have to treat it as khushboo street not mine but i have done my i've got 10 pages of journal on my dream for myself but now it is your dream so i'm glad you're looking at it as as a as your dream oh my god thank you so much thank you so mm-hmm. much for for adding that comment it is, it changes a lot for me thank yeah. you for otherwise um, you know you guys can never analyze me because you don't have my 70 plus years of life history to be able to analyze it but you have your life story so the way young kids work with dream group matrix is once it is gifted it becomes a dream of each each individual must treat it like it is their personal dream mm-hmm. 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 um so you guys you guys were talking about you you were talking about geeta and kali and because there is also another synchronicity which i just want to my mother's name was geeta and mm-hmm. uh, my kur devi is kali and mm-hmm. i have like no relationship of both of those things so you, you just put it back in my play kind of thing today it's um, and and i i lost my mother long back and and i read geeta and i know like even for gandhi bapu it was geeta the the scripture was his mother he treated it like that so and geeta happened in the battlefield kurukshetra ke yuddh mein geeta ka gyan mila tha and it just it is a very strong like there is something i always want to like understand about this sentence sentence in deeper and deeper deeper way that geeta's knowledge was given into the battlefield of kurukshetra so the circumstances was also added into the circumstances were needed or whatever horrible circumstances when the knowledge arrived so so i, I want you to say something on on it what do you feel about it well, of course we are also at a new battlefield against a unknown uh, an unfathomable energy and so it is like the kurukshetra but it is a, a battle but i think it's battle not just against the virus but against our own shadow because the virus is in the embodiment of the shadow of the collective and unless we see it not just as a virus but what parts of our shadow created that dynamic has made the right milieu for the virus to thrive in such a rapid manner what have we done to our planet what we have done to way we uh, put people in crowded places what have we done when we are raping the environment what have we done when we Uh, indiscriminately do certain things when all that is not understood uh, i don't think we will have an enduring resolution we will have sars and mers and ebola and this and that i mean it will continue till we get to the fundamental problem which is the collective shadow right so just to paraphrase then you would refer to the collective shadow as as the tendency of governments to hide it for example which made yeah, it worse yeah. that sort of thing 
Well, I think for, for example, in America, the big problem is people who are sick are afraid to go to get a test. I mean, even if you get one, which is if you're fortunate to have access to one, because yeah. uh, uh, who pays for the test? And if you find out you are sick, then who pays for the hospitalization if you're not insured? Yes, they will treat me, for example, if I was, if I was homeless and had no insurance. But then my grandchildren will be paying you know, the, the hospital bill for the next 50 years. Uh, so we created such a uh, toxic environment for people even to get help, even if it's there available. First of all, it's not available for many communities. There are no tests, but even if you had it, people are afraid. To, to get it. So what what have we created? What is that shadow? How are we going to deal with it? I mean, those are the real issues. Right. And certainly part of that shadow is your perception that uh, your grandchildren will be paying for it. Okay. They will. And, if I wrote about mm. that in one of my books, Retire Your Family Karma, whatever we create will take at least seven generations to retire, as it says in the Bible. I want to make a distinction between paying for it in a symbolic sense and paying for it. I think we really pay in terms of environment, pays in terms of the damage we are creating to environment. Okay. The right. I, I, I just want to make sure. Yeah, I just oh, want to okay. make a distinction between that symbolic sense and yes. physically paying for it in the form of the national debt. The national well, debt. That too. I mean, that is also part of, of, of our, you know, we are leaving them with this kind of uh, burden. Well, uh, it's, a, it's a perception. Kind of... It's a perception that's sold by the Federal Reserve Bank that uh, yeah. that's the case. But actually, the yeah, Federal don't Reserve Bank. government money. It's about our grandchildren's money they are using. Well, okay. No wonder my grandchild was noisy in the dreams of eight minutes. <laughs> what about me? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. I, I'll leave it at that. I, I, um, it's a good question. But we can certainly yeah, dialogue we, a lot about that. Yeah. I, I don't want to divert our conversation. I just am very appreciative. I don't, I'm not familiar with Jungian psychology enough to really contribute from that aspect. But I, um, I, I think that so many different, uh, ideas that have been brought up here um, have like really spawned a lot of thoughts. And so I'm kind of taking this deeper. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Mirtis, do you, do you have anything that you want to add? No. Okay. And Cynthia, how about you? I'm listening and I'm, I'm taking in what I can. Sometimes I get more from from some of it than from others of it. The quality of the audio is a factor, and um, sometimes I can understand better if somebody's speaking about what was just spoken about, I get it more. <laughs> so I'm just trying to let it all osmosis get into me. Well, I think it's typical of Jungian psychology that you have to go over these things time and again yeah. uh, before they you really grok them. You know, and and I, I assume that. I take that as given. Yeah. Right. So. Tim. Well, man, there's, there's so much richness in this. One of the things that... Um, that really struck me is the, the appearance of the virus uh, in the, in, as the shadow of the collective. And I'm, I'm also thinking about the, the virus as the introduction of the feminine in a new way. Um, particularly for me in, in the fact that we have to concentrate on our relationships and suddenly relationships are more important than anything else. Not only for the health of, of each of us in particular, but for our, our uh, kind of political understanding of the relationship in between nations and communities and religions. Uh, 
I think there's a there's a great richness there that really intrigues me. I was struck with um, with what you were saying about um, also the 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 animus in the man and the anima in the woman. And I just wonder if you could give us a few more words about that. I was fascinated with that idea. And that's always been a place where I don't have a whole lot of understanding. You know, how can I attach to my own animus? And I uh, just wonder if you could illuminate that a little. I think uh, that uh, it was sort of the central theme of Red Book actually that Jung started out with identification with the heroic animus. He was the hero, the, the prince, uh, the heir apparent in Freud's empire, in Freud's system, and appropriately so. I think Freud was fond of him. He honored his wisdom and his intellect and his energy and his heroism uh, in terms of uh, he had experimental evidence for the Oedipal complex in terms of the word association tests and so forth. So it was a well-placed uh, honoring of his heroic dimension of, of Jung's anima, uh, or anima sado. However, for Jung's own uh, emergence, his own individuation, he had to move the needle of his anonymous connection from the hero archetype to the archetype of the wise old man, Philemon. Uh, so for him, the authentic animus for Jung was not the hero animus, but the anchor, the rishi, the mentor, the guide animus. Uh, so just as for so moving from a material, from an intellectual, from a power-driven uh, animus identification to a spiritual, selfless, guiding others, soul guide image, because uh, Philemon is a soul guy, uh, Animus was uh, the essential transition in Jung's journey. So in each one of us, there is a similar transition. Uh, whatever Animus identification we have, which is the pacemaker of our ego consciousness, outer consciousness, our dreams, our, uh, our insights will give us guidance as to what is the next threshold uh, in the rung of our Animus development for men, and anima development for women. For women, it may be, for example, different. They may be very soulful. They may be very spiritual. And their um, anima may be like a Kali anima to become empowered and to become fierce and to become powerful and to become an advocate and to become a sort of a protectoress uh, of self and others. So to move from a sort of a soul anima to a sort of a fierce warrior anima uh, that maybe sort of sounds a little antithetical to male development, but for women, that may be the development that may be essential for an authentic animal uh, assimilation. So that uh, is a reverse trajectory than for men, for example. So that, that uh, may be counterintuitive, but how can from being the soulful, loving, caring, compassionate, uh, sacrificing woman, to becoming a kind of a kick-ass bitch, uh, but to honor that inner bitch, to honor that inner warrior goddess, the inner Kali, the Artemis, uh, is what we call for a majority of women in our collective to claim an authentic connectivity with their anima. Wow. Um, yeah, beautiful, thank you. Yes. And, and my daughter Ami is a good example of that. I mean, she's very soulful, and now she's an advocate, and she, uh, you know, is a kick butt kind of feminine energy. Is is uh, is taking you know leadership in uh, in our community. I'm very proud of her. But I mean that, is for her, for example, is her journey. That's why she showed up in my dream, because the the guidance of His Holiness, of course, is the guidance for the collective, the authentic, the mature masculine, the mature animus, which is, of course, in Buddhist tradition. The, the trinity of intervention uh, in the Buddhist prescription for our collective is Buddha, Sangha, and Dharma. Those three legs is what spirituality stands on. Buddha is, of course, to have a God image of your choice. It could be Buddha, Krishna, Christ, Muhammad, 
is Jesus, Moses, whatever is your soul guide. So, your, so that's your, your Buddha. And then there is Dharma, which is spiritual purposefulness, aligning your life with a high purpose. And third is Sangha, which is communitas, collective. We can only survive this virus as a communitas, as a collective. No one nation, no one individual, no one family, no one community can do it by themselves. We just need a Sangha. We need a communitas. There is no other choice. Um, can I make a comment? Sure. Absolutely. Um, and as you, as I was just listening to you, Ashok, and my thoughts were going back to um, going back to your description of the dream. And thank you so much for that gift because now it is my dream. And, mm -hmm. um, and I put it kind of collectively side by side with an actual experience that for me was extremely dreamlike. Um, mm -hmm. And this, this past year, I've been traveling the last three years, and I'm hoping that I can still go this year for my fourth year. But I've been traveling to India, and then some to Nepal, and um, on spiritual pilgrimage. And this last year, we, our group, um, our Sangha from Jakarta and from Annapolis, together, we traveled, but we stopped in Dharamsala, and we had one day, we actually were able to get audience um, in uh, His Holiness's private room. Mm. And so I had an opportunity, you know, I was the first one to ask a question and we talked about Mount Meru and his belief in that, that there's no, well, anyway, I'm not going to paraphrase what he said. I could never do that. But after our, our teaching, it was an hour and a half long, we, we got an opportunity to go up and we were going to do, you know, get a group photo. And I was way in the back of the room, just much like when I went and visited uh, His Holiness Karmapa in 2015, I was against the back wall. And mm -hmm. um, I also got an opportunity because he saw my hand wave and he pointed, you, you, and I came up. But so this time again, I was way in the back row and I had my hand up with a question. And I, so I got to have a little bit of dialogue with him. And at the very end, I thought, well, let everybody, you know, go up first. And so I kind of went off to the side wall and his, uh, his, the people that are there, he has many people that help, help him and keep the room secure they kind of like did this. And so, you know, so I, I was like, oh, okay, I didn't know what to do. So I walked up and I just stood right beside him to his left. Mm. And it's like time stood still. It, I must have been mm. there for two years, five years mm. standing there. And I always thought in advance, you know, what I would say if I got to meet His Holiness. But I was like, I, I went to open my mouth and nothing would come out, nothing. And I was even like so honored that I was afraid to like, I, I totally forgot that I was, I should, you know, be lower than him, but he was sitting and they had us standing. So I, I felt very confused, but he turned and he grabbed, put his hand on my arm and just kind of looked up at me like that. And it just reminds, I mean, I still have that emblazoned in my, in my mind. And I, I, so for me, it was very, very dreamlike. So now I have a second dream mm -hmm. um, because I often think how, how would it have, I mean, sometimes I go back and I think, oh, darn it. I, I had that opportunity to at least thank him. I hope he knows that I was so thankful and so honored to meet him. But his face was like 18 inches from mine. Wow. Mm -hmm. And I, I still feel sometimes, you know, that hand on my arm. And so now having this dream of 
him being upstairs. I have an upstairs. Mm. And having this dream of him being upstairs and trying to, you know, allow him time to rest um, is, it's just, it's very much akin to my dreamlike experience. And mm. I, I just, I, I feel, and, and it seemed like it was a long time before the rest of my group was mm-hmm. finally allowed to come up. Mm. And I, you know, I, I have that picture and I'm still at his left. Um, but he's left such a um, imprint. I mean, of course, on my arm. <laughs> but I, I often sometimes um, grapple and struggle with regret that I, that I didn't. I, I, I learned later that he really likes to look people in the eye. Mm-hmm. And I felt um, that I was not good enough to look directly. I mean, I looked a couple times. And I just felt like I was just not, you know, it's not that I wasn't good enough, but I I just, I felt so, I was in the presence of such a revered moment Mm. that my heart was bursting, but I I just, I didn't know how to respond. And sometimes I go back and I think, darn it, I wish I would have, you know, locked eyes and stayed locked because we did look at each other in the eye and I, I put my hand on his hand when he put his hand on my arm. And so I, I thanked him in that respect. But having this dream now gives me, just gives me another opportunity. So thank you. Mm-hmm. Sorry. Thank you for that. Sorry. Uh, I think Miles wanted to say something. Miles, or? Sure. Thank you. And uh, what an honor to listen to Dr. Betty today. Um, And I'd like to thank Sandy, you know, to in so far as reminding us that um, we are all just men and we are all, I would say, and I'll speak for myself, I guess, but (laughs) we're all flawed, right? And um, I believe uh, one of the things that makes me nervous is that I'm, I've had a lot of privilege and a big part of that privilege is to be able to hear all this. And uh, so with privilege comes responsibility. And I'm thinking my generation of men in particular, but of course, even everyone here today is, is, are hearing these calls to action. And so that imposes upon us an obligation. But as I said, I believe men have to step up, uh, especially. And uh, talking about, men but who are definitely flawed but do have shared um particular spiritual insights i'm i have in front of me maybe you're familiar with uh, russell means is an american uh, native american indian act- activist uh, this was a speech he did at the black hills international survival gathering in the black hills of south dakota it's said to be Russell Means' most famous speech, written in 1980. Ooh. And that strikes me that, oh my gosh, that's 40 years ago. It was only about 20 years after Carl Jung died. So I don't know how much Mr. Means, Russell Means, had read about Jung's work. But one of the things that strikes me as I look at this, he it says uh, at one point, the European materialist tradition of despiritualizing the universe is very similar to the mental process which goes into dehumanizing another person. So he's essentially saying what you started out saying, that what we're suffering from is um, too much of this focus on material ascendancy at the expense of spirituality. So he was very, uh, like so many First Nations people, um, very much in tune with truth. And that's what I'm finding. As I said, I'm on the traditional territory of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Nietzsche And I'm starting to realize they're tre- teaching me more about the virtues of Jesus Christ than I've ever heard anywhere else. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'll just conclude. He, he goes, the title of this speech from 1980 is for America. And I'll include America also means Canada. For America to live, Europe must die. Now, he's not 
thinking of destroying Europe, but the, this materialism, because he goes on to say Christians, capitalists, Marxists, all of them have been revolutionary in their own minds, but none of them really means revolution. What they really mean is a continuation. They do what they do in order that European culture can continue to exist and develop according to its needs. So um, I'll conclude with that and thank you. Um. Ash Ashok, uh, we have a question that has come on my screen by synchronicity. It's from uh, one of our members who's not here today, but um, her name is Penelope Ryder. And Penelope had a, had a uh, abusive childhood, okay? And uh, her question, which is not directly, um, directed to you because she's doing something else, but uh, it's a question that is probably important is, um, how can I heal my childhood? So maybe too big of a question for today, but just. Uh... Well, I think, uh, you know, uh, in a way, each one of us must heal our childhood uh, because only through our wounds, uh, do we have a portal to receive the grace of the divine? Uh, so our wounds become our portals to the source if we can establish that connection. Uh, so that's number one, uh, that you know, we, we all must honor our wounds as a, as a portal to the source. Uh, and the way to, of course, connect with that wounded inner child is through doing one's inner work. Uh, to reach uh, out to the child and sort of reparent the child again, because each one of us, fortunately, are born with two sets of parents. We are our first set of parents, are, of course, our biological parents, uh, those imperfect human beings like us, who do their best, for better or worse, to raise us, uh, and by design, by de definition, because they are human. It will be a frail and, and imperfect parenting, even under the best of circumstances, let alone traumatic circumstances. But the second set of parents is where healing and redemption takes place, which is our archetypal parents, those timeless eternal parents uh, in the collective. So that is the reservoir of our parental wisdom. And I think the task is for the adult in us our inner work, in our inner journey, like Priyam's Red Book, and each one of us who does our inner work through whatever analysis or the journey to East or West or to the mountaintop, uh, your own metaphorical mountaintop, to reparent ourselves with the help of the archetypal wisdom of, of inner father archetype and inner mother archetype and the inner healer archetype. So that's a you know, question which is uh, profound, but I would say that would be the case is to A, forgive our parents, for better or worse, they did the best they could, and then B, to take the ownership and the authorship of rewriting your script, uh, and, and towards that, with, with a guide or a mentor if you can, if not, through your inner guidance, to invoke the archetypal inner parents, the two million year old self uh, in us. Each one of us has the timeless wisdom of our ancestral parents coded into the DNA of our limbic system. Uh, the two million year old wisdom, at least that we know is there. And to, to invoke that through our dreams, through our imagination, through our uh, fantasies, through our relationships, because relationships are basically archetypal also. Uh, we project a lot onto people around us. So all that, if it could be understood in, from in, in symbolic context, gives us a rich matrix for reparenting ourselves uh, with, under the tutelage and the guidance of archetypal parents. That is the, the profound uh, gift of Young's work, is to give us a venue to be able to, to make that second journey. That's very powerful and very useful. I, I very much appreciate that. Uh, let me just uh, 
ask Sandy. Sandy put uh, some emoticons on a response to something I said, and my vision is not good enough to see what those emoticons are. Sandy. Oh, can... yeah, there were a bunch of bees. A bunch bees. of bees, yes. Drones servicing the queen bee. <laughs> 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 I got it. Okay. Uh, Cynthia says regarding the question about Tony Wolf, I thought it was dis it was dismissed without an inquiry about what could be gained by answering it. It helps me to hear that Jung's female colleagues were part of the sacred feminine. Knowing the purpose of the inquiry makes it all the more relevant. An opportunity. Uh, an opportunity was missed? Question mark. May I may I say something sure. before anybody else comments? My the image that I had in my mind in regards to the divine feminine was, I saw Jung, at one of his darkest hours, as an analyst, sitting on a couch while a patient, a woman, lay, and the the this woman felt felt Jung's pain and was and self-authorized herself irrespective of the role boundary she rose up and told Jung to lay down and that she was going to work with him and he felt he felt that that sense of safety and that there was a divine feminine coming through her to help him. And that was the start, I think, of their collegial relationship. I don't care about whether they were having sex or not. I mean, human beings can do what they want to do. I, I don't, you know, restrain myself to those ideologies. But um, that's what I was, that's what I was imagining. Well, I ordered that, that all of the great contributions mm -hmm. that she she did, and the fact that his, uh, uh, you know, uh, Mrs. Jung and Tony Wolf uh, collaborated, you know, with Jung, the three of them, and I think that that is fascinating. You know, I mean, that talk about feminine energy coming to coming together to help this conduit, as you say. Mm -hmm. Well, absolutely. I think I could not say better than you, Sandy. I think it's very soulfully put. Uh, when two people are in an uh, alchemic vessel together, ostensibly it's the therapist or the analyst who's trying to heal the, the, the client, the patient, the analyst. But that is just a accident of time and history and circumstances. In reality, in alchemic sense, in a deeper sense, both partners are there to heal each other because I've learned more from my patients than from my, many of my teachers. Uh, and I'm grateful for that. Now, of course, that is not the primary object of the encounter. I should not uh, and would not make that the primary goal, but whatever healing and guidance and soul instructions I get from my encounters for my patients, I get plenty. Uh, I can write more books about that than what I have done. Uh, but that, uh, is still there opus and I cannot appropriate it, but that healing occurs because in a real alchemic encounter, all participants are transformed, not just the patient, but the healer as much. But the key is that the, the, the focus has to be on the healing of the one who has sought help. Uh, and that is a sacred responsibility, but that does not preclude my patient understanding uh, when there was 9-11 and many patients uh, Many individuals assumed I was maybe an Arab or it looked like an Arab person or whatever. All my women patients particularly were extremely protective and, you know, feeling for me and wanted to protect me and, and so forth. And I was grateful for that because uh, people as you well, he's fine, you know, he's a therapist, he's a doctor, he can manage it. But I was scared. I was scared for myself. I was scared for my family uh, uh, as to what can happen. And of all people and friends, it was my female patients who had deepest empathy and support. And I was grateful for that. Yet that, that I'm not going to expect that, but it, it was what it was. 
Right. There's a, that's a terrific anecdote uh, mm -hmm. show. There's a famous quote of Emma Young, which I think came out of a, a more primitive, perhaps a feminine place, which where she said, I'm great. I'm grateful for Tony Wolf because she got Carl Jung through his Red Book period, his which was some, mm -hmm. pardon? His darkest moment of his life. It, right. And, mm -hmm. and Emma could not do it and she knew it. And, <laughs> you know, to, maybe there's a, you know, there's maybe a part of her that wanted exclusivity with her husband, but, and maybe that's a natural human reaction. But at the same time, she understood that there were parts of him that needed attention that he, she could not address. And, mm -hmm. and she made the space for that, even to the point of having uh, Tony in the house every Sunday for, mm -hmm. for dinner and the afternoon together. Uh, clearly, most of us are, are not just mental, but but uh, grateful to Tony Wolf, uh, Carl Jung, for uh, you know for seeing him through. He might have committed suicide if he had not had help. I don't know. Maybe she was the magic ingredient that uh, became his animal guide. Uh, so you know, it's a mystery we never understand, uh, but we can honor it. Right, and S Sandy, I agree with you that that the women have not gotten as much credit as they deserve. I've often observed that, and um, sometimes I've, I've wept about it in front of the camera. But but it is it is coming. It's coming. I mean, we're we're starting to see books about Sabina Spielrein and and Tony Wolf and. You know, many people are interested in this. So, yes, it it was swept under the rug for many years. I think it was partially because our culture maybe was not ready for it. But you know, we're gradually getting there. That's the emergence of the feminine, isn't it? I show. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> right. Kushbu is the only Indian woman to have had the benefit of this teaching out of 600 million Indian women. She's the only one that's gotten this teaching today. I wonder if you have any thoughts, Kushbu. I wonder if uh, Ashok sir is having any thought on that. <laughs> well, I'm very, very glad to be with uh, you and, uh, and with this wonderful uh, assembly. I hope uh, that we had a dialogue which brings some of the wisdom of young and of course the East to bear on this collective crisis. Uh, of course, we can always deal with it uh, better as a community than each one of us alone. So I'm also grateful that we had a alchemic vessel to put our collective thoughts, feelings and reflections together. Uh, you're going to put this in some kind of a webinar that can people can look at later on yeah, it'll it? be on on the the young uh carl young depth psychology reading group uh, can you kindly send me a link so i can show really? it to all my friends and relatives <laughs> surely i will do that thank you um so um what I, I just wanted to um uh just just ask ask little bit sir um where are you in your space, in your world? And if you, so we, we normally like this group was built initially for checking in everybody um, from all around the world, check in with each other and somewhere we might balance the global collective psyche and with, with that, that kind of intention. So, so whoever you are, the way where you are coming from, I just, invite you to check in with all of us. How are you? Where are you? Where is your... Um, that is how we all met. So I just wanted to invite well, thank you. For the invitation with, uh, with Skip's permission, I'll, I'll, I'll drop in once in a while. <laughs> if I... Yeah, please. Uh, <laughs> thank uh, you. I, I will add you to our list. Okay. Um, so you. one of the things uh, that 
that Thomas Arst did mm -hmm. and I've been trying to do for over a decade now um, is to try to bring uh, Dr. Young's work to a broader community. And um, most of the time when, um, when I have approached the Jungian community, even when I was trying to find an analyst at one point in the spirit of every analyst needs an analyst, uh, because I regard my role as, as trying to analyze society in the context of Jungian thought, um, every time I've approached it before now, I, I've bounced off. And meanwhile, when I approach people, one of your colleagues that's in the book, I won't mention the name, but the response was, what you're doing is very important, but, but it wasn't that uh, response wasn't amplified, as you say. So I wonder if you have any thoughts about what we're doing here. I think you did a wonderful job. I, I had fun with it. I thought the dialogue uh, was useful and the questions were deep uh, and uh, very thought provoking. And I will take them seriously and uh, deepen my own work and my own opus. So, no, I think it was an alchemic uh, connection. And I'm grateful for your efforts, you and, uh, and Tom, when you put this whole material and energy together. It's, it's work, it's service. And I honor you for that. Uh -huh. I wonder if we could get the name of his blog, how we can... Ah, uh, yes. I showed the name of your yes, blog. Uh, it is uh, my website, www.path to the soul. My first book, Path to the Soul, American Say Path, the India Say Path, path to the soul com, And uh, under that, as uh, you click on the blog section, and it will come up with the blog of the day and all the community blogs. I think we've done about 25 or 30 uh, for the last 30 days. Uh, so, uh, and it's also published via the Chicago Young Institute website. You can go to their site and click on the blog and you might get there. But easier is for through my site, it will be easy for you. Great. Uh, so, we're closing that in a minute. I think I know. Yep, dot com. I'm uh, sorry. Uh, dot com, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So we we um, we can, uh, say a little invocation at the end. Yes, Kushbu. Yes, Kushbu. A famous closing uh, invocation. I uh, look forward to that as we close. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you, Ashok, so thank much you. for being here today. Thank we appreciate it very much. Kushbu, you're up. Hmm. <clears throat> We pray for the well-being of all the world and we pray for the well-being of the people of all the world. Uh...
God bless you, everybody. Thank you. God bless thank, you. Thank you, Kushbu. That was delightful. And thank you so much for joining us today, Ashok. I, I, I will get this posted within the next couple of days. No problem. Thank you. Be well. Thank and you a so wonderful much. little synchronicity. But just as you were, Kushbu, as you were giving us your invocation, the old church has a very primitive bell that started to ring when mm. you were singing. Mm. Oh. Lovely addition. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Ashok. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank Take you. care now. Bye-bye.